Our last session, we call it the Nutrient Monitoring Collaboration of Partnerships. And I think we started out this morning and we talked about just, and I really appreciate every speaker talking about how important those collaboration, collaborations have been and partnership has been to really get both the funding and the expertise and the resources just overall together to really move us as far for, forward as we have in these last five to seven years, I wanted to say. And so um, we're we're really going to be do, focusing on this this during this session about how we can maximize our resources, but then um, we'll go into some final questions and answers and um, final thoughts um, before closing. So do you want to introduce? All right, so we've got our first speaker, Brian, who's going to talk about the USGS Nutrient Monitoring Program, which we've heard a little bit before from Keith and Tamara, but I think he's going to focus a little bit more in on the, the okay. nutrient monitoring part of it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Uh, before, before I get started, I'm going to put something I wanted to say last time. We actually did, so Climate scenarios are part of what we're facing in our future, but uh, the population growth, land use change is also a huge component of what we're going to see. Um, the USGS did a large nationwide study that I was part of where we were looking at, um, if you remember the old IPCC scenarios, where they, they projected different uh, population and land use. But, you know, you have to account for increasing agricultural intensity, water demand, all these things. It was a, a pretty high concept study. We we projected for the next 50 years, every decade, um, the response and the nutrient um, coming down the Sacramento and San Joaquin side. That data is all available. It's been online. It's, yeah, it's a little bit of a creepy study. It's mainly useful for kind of understanding the difference between different development, different the differences between future scenarios in terms of climate, but also land use change. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. Oh, another comment I wanted to make since you've got, you got to listen to me now. <laughs> He's got the floor. <laughs> you got to listen to me now. Uh, uh, you know, we had in 2016, we had these great big diatom blooms. They were kind of a diatom that, that the culinary cocoa pods that we want to restore to our lower food rights cannot eat, not grow on. On the other hand, looking up in the, uh, up in the, uh, the uh, Tashlu area, uh, that study with uh, Lynn Kimmerer's group, um, we found that the Kalamata cocoa pods up there using metagenomic methods were eating, say it with me, blue green algae, <laughs> <laughs> including microcystis. Um, so let's not, I mean, we just need to move past the old, you know, diatoms are good and, and blue green algae are bad. We actually need to look at things you know. So this is my talk. Now I can get started. <laughs> I have to talk a lot faster. Um, I, um, <laughs> I was talking to Melissa and Jennifer uh, when I found out finally that I was actually talking at this session. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I realized I was talking at this session. Um, um, Get it. Yeah. Go back. Go back. Gotcha. <laughs> you just gave everything away, man. Um, uh, but I, was, uh, I, I called them up and I said, what, uh, what do you guys want to hear? What do you want me to talk about, really? And they said they want to they want me to talk about the USGS Nutrient Monitoring Program. And I said, fantastic, short talk. We don't have one. <laughs> um, and, uh, we don't. We don't have a nutrient monitoring program. A, you know, a monitoring program, the way I think of it, is something that's where where there's a long term commitment. Where I mean, our our program is is uh, has no you know there's no regulatory compliance component. There's no legislative appropriations for it to continue over the long term. It's it's funded segment by segment. We are a research program. That's we are a soft money research program. We live proposal to proposal, and we we are really interested in these things. As I'll get into, but um, we, we support our interest in these things on a proposal by proposal basis, and we write um, proposals to this entire Rose Gallery of of funding agencies um, from the Delta Regional Monitoring Program, the um, 
VOR supports the bulk of what is normally thought of when people think about a monitoring program, our fixed station network, but Tamara showed USGS sticks in a ton of money um, as well. Um, but we get money from Fish and Wildlife, from the Delta Stewardship Council, to, to and, and these are usually funding um, um, the more innovative aspects of what we try to do. We're trying to add new kinds of sensors, try to measure new kinds of things. We've had, we currently have funding from NASA, something we're getting, we've had funding from NOAA, DOE, EPA, uh, um, the state water contractors, everybody up there. Um, it, it's, um, yeah, and we're very grateful for that funding and it allows us to do a lot of work. Next slide, please. Oh, the other thing we're grateful for that I should have said is like all the people in the pictures. <laughs> And all the people whose names were up there were the ones who really do this work. Um, but like I say, we're a research group <clears throat> with an active emphasis in improving monitoring. So we want to research things, and a lot of things, well, our, our research efforts are on rates. We want to understand rates. Now, we want to understand rates so the modelers can put the appropriate rate in their models, and we can improve our models. We want to do that. But that's not the only reason we want to study rates. We want to we want to understand if the rates in our system are changing over time. So we want to monitor the rates as they change over time. So we think it's appropriate to do long term monitoring of, of environmental rates. But I'm going to focus um, something hard for me to do, but I'm going to focus on um, this last uh, question is how we can improve monitoring technology and practice and because I think that's what you all are mostly interested in what I was it was suggested that you would be interested in hearing a little bit about the kind of broad picture of what we do and then you know what we were what we're doing now maybe a little bit about what we have done but what we're doing in the future so as you are thinking about the design of your program you know that more about what we're doing next slide please all right so tomorrow <clears throat> Um, so I think it's slide like this, um, where we've got 15 stations or so located all around the Delta. They look something like this. This is a long-term nitrate record, and we, we deploy these. Uh, it, typically, most of our stations are deployed at discharge sites, so we can get a good idea of what loading, uh, what loading is um, from each site. We, we collect a wide variety of parameters. We visit them every month and collect, grab samples, and we measure what's in the samples. Um, we, you, this is the, you know, kind of, this is the, the foundation of our program. We test sensors with it. We're constantly in this data asking questions. Um, we are, this, this grew over time in that we started in 2012. Uh, we put in about five sites in 2014, and then we've been adding sites where we thought it was important. And Jinlin, thank you for putting up that potato slough bloom. I don't know if some of you might have seen a little missive we sent out a while ago about that bloom at potato slough. We, I mean, this site was, it came to be because we, uh, we noticed we didn't have any data up there, you know? What the hell? Uh, um, so, uh, so we put our site up in there. And we saw things, fantastic things. That bloom she saw, it was. It took it took the uh, nitrate down to zero over the course of the bloom. Eighty micrograms at this station in the center. We saw that map. Uh, we mapped it. It was this huge wide area um, over this area. A uh, 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 diatom bloom. Good, right? No, it was the kind of diatoms that that does. Copacrots can't eat. It was the Alakasara. Um, so we're continuing to try to improve this. We've got five stations where we're putting out floor probes that give us information about the underlying phytoplankton community. Um, we are going to add a few stations. We are try, we're working with DWR more explicitly, trying to, you know, you saw the intercalibration stuff that, are, that we've been part of. We're adding additional things like that will hopefully make this a little bit cheaper in the future. Next slide, please. So you heard also that we do this um, this high speed mapping. I'm not going to go into it too much because you've seen some of it. Um, you know where we we've developed this method where we can dry cover about a hundred miles a day with this we're, we're collecting data about once per second, and so we get very high um, spatial resolution because we realize that if we want to connect 
um, our understanding of nutrient cycling and phytoplankton production to landscape elements such as herbaceous marsh or submerged aquatic vegetation or tide flats or something, we needed a much greater um, spatial resolution in our analysis. So we, we developed this over a number of years. We no longer do it on an open boat. We have a dedicated research boat for this uh, kind of work. Um, we did four years of seasonal maps all across the Delta, um, uh, probably 12 maps up in the Cache Slough complex, and most of them are published and available in science Base online. We are, they are used for remote sensing calibration by some groups. They're used for model calibration by other groups. Um, it's a, an amazingly uh, rich data source and in there, they're used by us to uh, try to understand what's going on um, in the Delta. None of, we've got no future Delta-wide um, uh, mapping surveys funded. Um, not that we're not writing proposals, we are. We don't have any funded. Um, um, we've this year, in collaboration with uh, Peter Hearns at the UC Davis, we've added particle characterization, and it's a, we're, we're actually characterizing the particles underway, and we're actually specifically looking at the particles that are of benefit to the lower food web, as determined by feeding experiments. So we do feeding experiments. We identify those particles with our gizmology, and then we see where in the delta do you find good particles. So that's coming up. Um, Jacob Fleck and Mark Marvin de Pasquale have been leading an effort uh, where they're using the technique to look at mercury and mercury species across the delta. We, in the future, we want to add all gases to this measurement for reasons I won't go into. Um, next slide. So tomorrow, I think she put up some, some iteration of this slide um, uh, and said I would talk about it more. So this is something we developed uh, to look at residence time or water age. And the, one of the difficulties in the Delta is that um, there, there's a variable amount of time between for different particles of water from when they come into the system to when they leave depending on what the route they take, what the hydrodynamic forcing is. Um, so we developed this method. It's based on water isotopes. So we continuously measure, um, we're using this gizmo here, uh, we continuously measure the isotopic composition of the water. And from that, we can calculate how much time the water has been in the system compared to a reference point. And when we do that, we can, we did that for like deep watership channel shack slough and prospect slough for this paper we've got out. And we were interested in, well, what, how do different landscape elements affect the rates we observe? So by using a space for time substitution, since we're sampling across gradients of age, um, you can calculate rates from this method. Um, the people were skeptical of this method, including us. We were very, you know, we were very happy to team up with Ed Gross, and he was putting his numerical models to work in the same area, and we got very good correspondence between the two. And in fact, um, some of our work uh, turned up some problems with his numerical model, where he had the bathymetries a little bit wrong. And it's, you know, so this was a great calibration. We're both improving our methods by working together. Um, we have got a few studies funded in the future in Frank's tract uh, using this method. There are just a huge amount of opportunities um, up those side sloughs off the McCallany and in the, in the Old River, up uh, deep water ship channel, the Stockton deep water ship channel to look at these longer term rates uh, that are very difficult to measure in a bottle or by any other means. But we've got nothing funded going forward um, other than the stuff on Frank's track. And we're continuously adding additional gizmology to the system uh, so we can, we can look at other um, biogeochemical variables. So we're putting more gizmos on our boat. Next slide, please. So one of the things we're kind of proud of, you guys know about this, but we developed this method um, when working with a company um, called Timberline Instruments in Colorado. Um, we developed a method for continuous measurement of ammonium 
at one hertz at um, ecologically relevant concentration. So we can get down to with, with sub micromolar accuracy, we can get down to about a micromole in concentration. So we learned a huge amount. Um, you've seen a couple of this, these kind of maps where we can track the ammonium across the system, but now we're using it more. Uh, now after the conversion, we can look at the ammonium production by different landscape elements like clams and wetlands and things like that using this technique. Um, tomorrow, I believe, mentioned that we've, uh, we've been wishing we had a, uh, a gauge version of this unit. So we could get um, time series of ammonium. Um, in fact, we've got funding with Dick Dugdale and Francis Wilkerson to do exactly that. And I believe I got an email saying the gizmo arrived in the office today. Uh, so this is very exciting. We're hoping to put this on a gauge house in the future. But uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, one of the you know, as far as I'm concerned, one of the largest gaps we have in our knowledge is the understanding the sediment water interactions um, with uh, you know that in, in a way that takes into account the you know the epibenthos, the microphytobenthos, um, uh, the different sediment texture classes we have out there, the different organic carbon content of sediments, and, and this was uh, an operation baseline funded study to. Uh, to build this thing, uh, Dave called it Gizmozilla, but I might have to change it to Roomba, although it's not as automatic as the Roomba. We wish it, we wish it were. Um, but this is basically a chamber you stick down on the bottom and you flow it through the same chemistry, you know, set we have on the back of our bow. We flow it through that chemistry set and we can make measurements of concentrations changes over time. So this is nitrate and ammonium. And from that, you can calculate the rate of invasion or evasion of material. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot behind that particular statement, but uh, we'll leave it there. Um, we also are looking at other methods because like um, eddy correlation flux measurements across the benthos and then uh, resin coring methods so we can, uh, that people have used elsewhere. Um, so we can look at the, the invasion or evasion of nutrients in the system here. But this is, uh, I think, a huge scientific gap that we need to work on. That first bullet point under future, no additional studies are funded. Tamara's got a bunch of data in the, the bag from her study that was funded. So we'll look at uh, what a dozen sites across the Delta and she's gonna get that papered out any day. I'm, I'm <laughs> Next slide, please. So the kind of holy grail of how we want to pull all the things together is through remote sensing. Um, I'm an oceanographer. I have a background in optics. Optics are what you use to, in the water optics are what you use to calibrate remote sensing reflectance. Um, and so we have been busy um, in our group trying to come up with new ways to calibrate what we measure in the water to the remote to the reflectance from the water. We call this radiometry. Uh, we've got a radiometer out at our confluence station here. Um, this was in a collaboration we had with NASA. And we've got a station set up on the Delaware River. Part of the USGS has got a um, uh, major interest in, in this technological development as well. And the idea is um, somebody dared to use the word hyperspectral here earlier today, so I feel like I can use it again. Um, but if you have sufficiently spectrally resolved data, you can get a lot more information. And the current satellites only have a few wavelengths. The satellites that are coming very soon have our hyperspectral. They've got a lot of different wavelengths. So we're out collecting data in our boat based mapping, in our um, other studies, and in some deployments on our stations. So we can develop algorithms so we can be ready when those satellites are launched. So we can use the data um, uh, properly. Um, when those satellites go up. So um, we got this paper out um, with Cedric Fischel 
uh, a while ago. So you take the remote sensing reflectance and you can you can uh, use models uh, to calculate the values that are in. This one was interested in organic carbon and eventually mercury um, from this uh, from Grizzly Marsh. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so another big effort we're involved in is the improved data access. We've stood up in the last several years, we stood up a whole data science group in our research group because we need to improve our access to data and the ease with which we can man manipulate that data. We, um, you all have seen some of it. We, one of our early efforts was to put that 2018 mapping data up online in, in one of these uh, visualization dashboards to make it accessible and explorable. And you can go in and ask your own questions, look through the data yourself. We've made a whole bunch of them. Here's our phytoplankton. Um, one, this you know, incorporates not only our data, but other agencies' data, the IEP data. We've got a hydroclimate one there, so you can look uh, back in time. What, you know, have we ever seen this kind of thing before? Um, this is the mapping data one. But behind all of this is an engine, this data pipeline, which is an automated process where we go out and strip the data, wrangle it, get it all together, get it in the same units. Um, we kind of get it all on the same geo reference plan. They did all that kind of really hard to do work and put it out there. And this itself is publicly accessible. People can hit it with whatever tool they want. And then it's very easy for us to build front end visualization tools that, so people can look in at the data. Is it useful? If they like it, they can download it or they can go back to the original source and grab it if they, if they want to go through the brain damage. This is uh, this is something of great interest to the USGS. Most of our funding to continue this is for the USGS and most of the work that the data group is now doing is for the national USGS. So we're kind of losing our data group um, to the national USGS. We're trying to pull them back in, but we're continuing to add different data types. We would love to hear if you have any ideas. We're adding uh, real-time modeling for some of this stuff. Not, not the kind of models we've just heard about, but um, more simple um, mechanistic biogeochemical models. Next slide. So a few recommendations. These are kind of recommendations, not necessarily to the regional monitoring program, but just from a scientist to the science community as we consider how to move forward. One of the things we're really missing in this community is uh, a way to respond to events financially. So we need to jump in the boat now because there's a large harmful algal bloom in San Francisco Bay. I know that would never happen, but, <laughs> you know, and, but, but uh, SFEI was uh, made, uh, able to get authorization um, quite quickly to spend money to do that. Other times we, we wanted to go out there and sample, but we can't. We need reliable long-term funding. We can't, you know, the, the problem is we can't get support from our agency if we only have agreements. I don't mean contracts or agreements that are long-term, but I mean a long-term intent that is expressed in writing that we can take to our management. We need level research program funding. So this is a worry. It's not like we need to increase the funding level. That's okay too, but we need level funding. It's really hard to staff up and then release people. It's just a huge waste. We train people, we get them going. We need to support that kind of data integration stuff. It's, it really is the best interest of the entire community. And we need to support explicit integration of models and monitoring data. Usually we fund these things separately, but we've seen great benefit in going out together and um, designing intentional experiments to improve our models. That's all I got. Two minutes. Mr. Brian. No, no, we have no minute. We have negative one. Wait, wait, we have negative. Oh, I listened to you. <laughs> Why? I have a stopwatch on it. Okay. You know what? We started a couple minutes later. There we go. Okay. All right. So our next um, next speaker is going to be Ted, right? 
from the neurological, uh, sorry, not even talking right, from IEP, um, and you talk about um, useful water quality investigations. That's not you. I'm reading the wrong section. You guys, no. No, that's uh, Leslie's going to talk at after 10. So oh, they're kind of a shared session. Yeah, like, I'm going to talk. No, it's one, it's one title, though. It is oh, one title. title. It's like we got like my bad. 50 50. Ted, welcome. Yeah. And you <laughs> can IEP and EFU. Okay. okay. It's so great. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 All right. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, sorry, this is a. This is a cover slide from another talk that I forgot to change, but it works. So, <laughs> um, so, so um, it's kind of, uh, I might have to, I, I don't think I have to skip through too much, but it's, I think I was trying to count. I think our data was used in almost every single talk today, which is really exciting. And so I thought, um, you know, you've already heard a lot about the data that we collect, so I hopefully can give you a little more background about how that data gets collected, who's doing the collection, why we're doing that collecting. So you can see there, if you don't know, that's our beautiful boat that we always like to brag about, the Sentinel. Um, and uh, so that's where a lot of our artistry, water quality, and biological. So uh, I'm Ted Flynn. I work for the Department of Water Resources. I'm the PI, the Environmental Monitoring Program. So next slide, please. So for, for those of you who don't, you know, people uh, showed a lot of our data today. Um, this is an overview of, of the entire environmental monitoring program right now. Uh, it's changed a little bit throughout the years. Uh, started in um, really kind of its modern form in 1975. Uh, so right now we have five components. We collect data for benthic invertebrates. Uh, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and then two types of water quality. We have our discrete water quality program, which is collecting water samples at 28 stations around the Delta. And we also uh, have our continuous water quality program, uh, which Scott Waller is the, the manager for that. And there's 15 continuous, uh, those little orange circles here, you can see kind of um, the South Central Delta out into, into the Bay Area. So this is a program that is jointly funded by DWR and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Um, most of the staff is DWR staff. Uh, we have seven environmental scientists, uh, two supervisors, uh, three scientific aides, and uh, two boat captains, an engineer, and a uh, water control technician. Um, there's also the zooplankton study, which is part of it that's actually run by CDFW. So that's kind of, it's funded, it's part of EMP, but it's funded separately. So CDFW staff lead that along with the taxonomic identification and the analysis and everything. So uh, we like to consider it part of, of uh, we're, we're all kind of one big happy family though. So um, next slide, please. So um, kind of DW Bar has been around you know, for almost 50 years now, there's some really great pictures of kind of the early days uh, of the water quality. A lot of, you know, water quality sampling was kind of recognized very early on as something very important to do in the Delta, even before the construction of the state water project. Uh, it was mostly for salinity intrusion relating to the Central Valley project, um, also some DO monitoring. But uh, as kind of the water boards came online and, and, and started regulating water quality in the 1960s, there was an acknowledgement that there would need to be regular monitoring in the Delta as the state water project started serving deliveries downstate. And so they actually uh, commissioned a study from the Stanford Research Institute. Um, I have a PDF of this paper if you ever want to read it. It's actually kind of interesting uh, to uh, to design what would eventually become the environmental monitoring program. It was published in 1970, um, and the data that we have now at the stations um, that we are current, some of this uh, data that we have from actually a good deal of our stations does go all the way back to 1975 monthly data. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so for discrete water quality, there's one of our intrepid scientific aides, Caitlin, uh, collecting data inside the water quality lab on the Sentinel. Um, so we collect water samples and filter them in the field, and all of our analyses for water quality are conducted at the Bright Chemistry Laboratory, which is also run by DWR. Uh, these are all the analyses um, that we do. You can see kind of uh, pretty standard, um, you know, 
bromide, ammonia, calcium chloride, silica, all that kind of good stuff. We've been working recently to make sure our methods are fully compliant with either standard methods or EPA methods. Uh, there were some kind of modified methods that had crept in over the years. And so, but now all the methods we have, we work, we have a QAQC program that's been working very strongly on this. And, and now all of our methods are in compliance with these uh, various EPA and standard water analysis methods. So next slide, please. Um, the continuous, uh, you know, the, we have a variety of measurements using XO2 water quality sons, um, and uh, we're kind of uh, testing out various things. This is where I think the, the interaction that we have with groups like the biogeochemistry group at USGS, you know, of working together to kind of find out best practices for rolling out new new instruments, you know, for one example of one would be the the uh, YSI exo nitro LED sensors, which everyone was very excited about to measure nitrate and it turns out they really don't work very well. And so we don't use them. And so, <laughs> but you know, that was something that, uh, you know, continuous nitrate measurements would be really excellent, really exciting, but we don't want to be collecting data that doesn't work and isn't useful. So, um, and then of course, you know, some folks have showed data from this, the one we've started collecting data on the Sentinel in uh, 2020 uh, was the fluoroprobe, so which collects the uh, uh, continuously collects uh, phytoplankton community composition um, and for cyanobacteria, green algae, diatoms, and cryptophytes. And we're also working to integrate these into some of our continuous stations to match what USGS is doing on their pile sites so that we'll have greater spatial coverage and we're all working together closely to make sure that of that. Um, so next slide. Uh, we also do biological monitoring. This is one of the, the big, I, I see it as the most important aspects of EMP is that we do the biological monitoring and the water quality monitoring simultaneously. And so these aren't separate aspects. So we collect all of the data um, together except for um, benthic invertebrates. So benthic has its own separate thing. We do collect water quality data, just not the full suite of discrete water quality measurements with benthic, and, which makes sense because, you know, a lot of cases we're collecting water at the surface. How representative is of that of you know what's actually experienced in the benthos? So, but so you can use that data to inform your understanding of biological community dynamics because it was collected simultaneously using you know by the same crew using the same methods at the same site. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, we are also uh, you know Brian mentioned making their data available you know through their platforms. We are working very hard to do the same thing, to make our data, you know, as publicly accessible and available as possible, as quickly as possible. Our uh, continuous water quality data is available in near real time through our website, CDEC. So you can get data every um, 15 minutes from those continuous uh, uh, data there. There's also, I will, uh, important to point out, uh, it feels like we always need to say this, that the data on CDEC is not QAQC. So if you're doing a long-term study, do not get all your data from QAQ, from CDEC. Ask, uh, it says that at the bottom, ask Scott, they have the QAQC, and we're working on making that QAQC data available. It's not available yet, but hopefully soon. Um, and then the different uh, various components of EMP's data are all available through the Environmental Data Initiative except for phytoplankton, which is really, really close. We're not quite there with that one. Um, but you can download the whole historical record of all of the EMP's data for all those sites. And so, um, and of course, you know, we work with USGS to make a lot of this data available. We don't just want it on our platform. If people want to integrate it, you know, uh, Sam Bashevkin's super tool uses the, phyto, the zooplankton data that we have. We're working on a phytoplankton synthesis that Jenna has been leading um, as well. And, um, so this is obviously, this is a really important thing because the data is only um, as good as people are using it. And as you all said today, people are using it, which is excellent. So next slide, please. Um, so we're kind of, uh, we work with, with IEP, you know, we're one of the kind of core monitoring programs in IEP. And, um, you know, I wanted to just mention, uh, that you know, EMP. We're collaborating with many you know ongoing phytoplankton synthesis projects, such as the phytoplankton and zooplankton synthesis programs. EMP scientists work on uh, Delta Science program initiatives like the NC Synthesis Working Group. Um, we're members of active project work teams like the phytoplankton and water quality one that Jenna uh, started up, and Bay Delta Data Science. And these are all um, 
Stephanie Fong asked me to mention, you know, these are all really important initiatives that, you know, bring us together like we're doing today, except they meet regularly and, and produce products. And so that we, you know, I know I've been writing down lots of things to follow up on after today and things I want to look up. And, you know, being a part of these project work teams, I think is really important because it, it's a way to do that consistently and so that we can all uh, stay on the same page and so that when we do these synthesis efforts, our, uh, our data is useful. So, and we also try to be good collaboration partners um, working, you know, like we've we worked on the chlorophyll comparison study that Liz Stumner led. We, you know, part of the cyanotoxin study was felt funded by Delta RMP, now is funded by Delta Science Program. Um, so, you know, we're out on the water so frequently. We go out, uh, the Sentinel's out six days a month. Uh, we also, or gosh, now it's eight days a month because of Benthic. Um, and, uh, you know, so we have nine total field days every month. So we're collecting a lot of samples. And so we try to make, okay, great. Um, try to make ourselves available to collect additional samples um, if they make sense for, for the mission that we have. Next slide, please. I um, also wanted to shout out to another aspect of EMP, which Jenna actually led for many years um, before she left here. Um, but uh, who was the dissolved oxygen monitoring in the uh, Stockton Ship Channel, which is actually EMP we've been doing since the 60s, so it actually predates EMP. Um, and uh, we use our, it's part of the EMP's uh, continuous monitoring of looking at DO and um, um, near the aeration facility on Stockton and so, or on the Stockton Ship Channel. So if you go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to use this to kind of highlight, this is some data from Jenna's uh, um, report that, that she wrote on this and you can see how you know 2008 2009 2010 we would have a lot of uh failures on uh the uh do objectives at that particular area that are set in the basin plan and then they installed the aeration facility you know there the um uh stocked and upgraded their wastewater treatment and for a long time we weren't having any but actually you know the world is changing things aren't static they're not staying the way they are, right? We can't just rely on the solutions that we've discovered. And after many years of not having to go out and do additional monitoring, because we weren't getting any failures, both this, last year and this year, EMP has had to go out and do additional because we've had failures on this, even with the ration facility functioning. And that's because of really, really high temperatures, which caused the DO to drop. And this year we had some mechanical failures, which mean the ration facility is not working and getting those things. And, you know, Salmon don't care about that. That's not important to them. These are things that the reason these DO objectives are set is because they're important for the ecosystem. And so we can't just do these fixes and say, OK, great, we're done. This is a, you know, active monitoring. You know, if we look at this is uh, this is just a quick graph I put together of the September mean temperature at Rough and Ready Island, starting from when we installed the it, It's going up, up and up and up. That's water temperature. And so, you know, there's no reason to think that's going to change anytime soon. So, um, you know, we have to be vigilant and keep, you know, it both proves the value of these historical, these long-term monitoring programs that have were the result of hard, hard work by many, many people over decades to make sure that they keep going. Like Ryan mentioned, one of the reasons EMP exists is because it has been consistently funded for decades, right? And, you know, I don't have to write proposals every three years to say, hey, can we fund a UMP for three more years? This is something because it's written down, because it's in T1641, we have to do this. And so that is why we have this record. And it's extremely valuable. And I think it's extremely valuable, you know, as we've seen this amazing data that's collected by all these different parties, you know, that we work on ways to do that consistently. So next slide, please. Um, you know, I don't have to talk too much about why the value of this concurrent monitoring, you know, of our benthic data showing, the, you know, we weren't expecting to see invasive clams when we started collecting benthic data in 1975, but sure enough, we were there when it happened. We were also collecting phytoplankton and chlorophyll measurements of water quality, you know, so we saw that, we see that record. Next slide, please. You know, we see this in the harmful algal blooms. And this is a time when we were, this is Keith's picture, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, this is another, this is a great example, both of, you know, prepared thinking and also, um, uh, this is a great example of collaboration. This is the data that EMP collected on our floor probe, but it was analyzed by USGS scientists, by Jennifer Soto. And, you know, that's, you know, by working together, we can create these things. And we were able to use this within just a few months to um, write a report about the effect of the drought and the drought barrier on HABs. So, you know, but the only reason this data exists, and you go to the next slide, please, 
This is data of our biogeochemistry data from Frank's track from that summer. The reason this exists is because in 2015, we had the first drought and we installed the first drought barrier. We said, hey, we need to install a continuous water quality sensor at Frank's track. So this data only goes back to 2015 because you can see they installed it in the middle of the summer. But then when the next drought happened, we were ready. And then we could see pH in Frank's track, you know, usually in the summer, there's a lot of SAB there. You get pH pretty high, showing a lot of uh, carbon fixation from SAB and other types of things. But last summer when we had the bloom, here's um, DO. DO is up around, the, the height of the bloom is almost 200% saturation. That's the daily mean. That's not the high, right? It's bubbling oxygen out there. There's so much photosynthesis going on there. The daily mean pH was over 10, 10 and a half. You know, these are, but, and the reason we have this data to understand this is, you know, this is, you know, we all look at our nutrient data, the, the kind of our favorite things like nitrogen and, and, um, you know, looking at chlorophyll and all these things that we can directly tie to those things. But don't forget about the other types of data too. I love pH. I always think pH is fascinating. I wish more people, I wish more of the continuous stations measured pH. Unfortunately, this, the Frank's, the EMP station at Frank's Tracks is the only one that did. So we don't, we only have it for that one station. But um, anyway, uh, next slide, please. Anyway, this is my acknowledgement slide. Thanks to everybody. This is our, our EMP crew here. Um, and you know, if we had room for um, all of the EMP staff, I have some dream of making like a family tree of EMP that would cover <laughs> this entire slide in two point font. But of course, you know, Keith, Rosie, Dave, um, other folks as part of the synthesis efforts. And so, uh, thanks. Any questions? Head talk is Leslie. It, um, does she have slides? I think she, she has, did. She sent. I saw. She did. She did send. Yeah, only two minutes left. Yeah, we only have about a couple minutes left in this session or this top time frame. Um, so Debbie, we did leave twenty-five minutes at the end. So if we look at, we've got ten minutes at the end of this session, yeah. and then we have another twenty-five minutes or twenty minutes or so for okay. the final question. So I think maybe we'll just give her a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, um, I can make this really quick. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we yeah. can. Thanks, Leslie. Okay, okay, great. So our MWPI program, I, I feel, is probably a lot, lot smaller than uh, what's going on with EMP, but we do have some areas of interest that you guys might want to know about. And Steve San Julian is also on the line, um, and Steve is in the MWPI program, so Steve could have easily have given this presentation um, just as well. But our program was established in 1990, and it's basically funded by the state water contractors um, that pay into a fund. And our focus is on drinking water quality. So the main things that we do are monitoring at discrete and continuous stations. We also do some modeling, forecasting of water quality. And then we disseminate that data to the contractors. And we also have a website to do that. Um, and then we have our database as well as special studies. Oh, and we also do a, a large report every five years called the Watershed Sanitary Survey. Next slide. Uh, so basically, I pretty much said this already, but our focus um, primarily is on the real-time monitoring stations that we do at five locations, and we do discrete monitoring at 16 locations. So again, it's just to provide this comprehensive database for the contractors and other interested parties focusing on drinking water quality. And there's a link to our website there, rtdf.info. Um, we have daily data posted on there that's updated, and then there's also a weekly snapshot as well. Next slide. Um, okay, this didn't quite show up for some reason, but this this was supposed to show a map showing the five discrete monitoring stations and then the 16 discrete, but some for any reason, we'll, we'll just keep going. Oh, okay, it's, it's animated. I didn't realize that. <laughs> okay. So the five real-time monitoring stations are there on the left which are in red, with the, which is at Hood, Banks, Jones, Vernalis, and Gianelli. And then it's probably gonna show the discrete next. You can keep clicking. Okay, great. And those are shown in the green. 
Next slide. And just so you can get a quick understanding of what we have continuous monitoring at the five stations, this is at Banks. So this is just downstream from Clifton Court. And this is kind of a pivotal site for drinking water because it's kind of like the start of the state water project. So we have continuous data for organic carbon, bromide, um, EC, chlorophyll, nitrate, and other um, physical parameters. Next slide. And then this is uh, just a table, and I won't go over this, of what we're monitoring at our 16 discrete monitoring sites. Most of most of this is occurring on a monthly basis. And you can see that the majority of our sampling is at banks. But we do take nutrients every month um, for most of these locations. And I could not tell you how far back that data goes, but I would probably assume that it's going back, I don't know, 25 years or so. Next slide, please. Uh, we do have some special projects. I was trying to think of what we are doing specifically for nutrients. We did actually try to analyze, uh, I mean, install a real-time ammonia analyzer uh, at the hood station. But unfortunately, we had a lot of biological growth on the filter, which is inside the instrument. That occurred on a daily basis, which basically took all the nitrogen out. And so we did not get any reading. So we kind of like thought about what were our different options, but it would it would have been really a large project. You know, it would be either somebody having to go down there and, you know, replace that filter all the time, or we'd have to replumb the whole system and filtration system. So we unfortunately had to decommission it after about a year of testing. Next slide. And then our second um, project that we're working on that would be of interest to you, and we had a a meeting with USGS, probably now it's been over a year and a half, where we talked about this as a joint project between DWR, Water Research Australia, and Valley Water. Where we're trying to see if we can develop an early warning system for cyanotoxins and also for taste and odor in source water. Next slide. So we have two study sites um, at the Banks Pumping Plant and at Pacheco Pumping Plant which is at the San Luis Reservoir. So again, we're trying to see if we can use data collected from probes, which would be like chlorophyll A or phycocyanin, and see if we can relate those to grab samples for taste and odor, which would be MIB and jasmine, or also discrete samples for cyanotoxins. So we're collecting all of this data. We did this in 2020 and 2021. And now we're trying to find those correlations using models. That's the part that Water um, Research Australia is doing for us. Next slide. And then the second part of the project is we're comparing uh, the Turner Design C3 probe with the YSI EXO probe for um, these different uh, chlorophyll A and phycocyanin and other parameters. Next slide. And this data has to be updated. This is only like the first year of data, but just to give you just a sense of, of what we're doing is, you know, again, we're comparing discrete samples from microsystems, systems in the pink with chlorophyll readings in the blue. And um, again, we have to update these. We're working on these in the final report. Next slide. I think it just it's just showing the other, yeah, the other probe, which is phycocyanin and with microcystin. So we're still working on this. You can keep going. Um, so we are finishing up the data analysis. We are hoping that you know we are going to find some correlation between the microcystin and and what the some of the probe data is showing us, but we don't know yet right now if we're going to be able to find a good enough correlation that we can develop like a, a HAB trigger. And I do not have a final date for when the report is going to be done, but um, we are supposed to have like another follow-up meeting and I'll probably be able to get back to you guys on that. And I think that's it. Oh, I have two additional slides, which is just going to quickly talk about that um, cyanotoxins are also monitored by DWR um, at the following locations in the map. Um, it just 
really quickly just shows you the sites and the frequency depends on the month. And um, I think that's about it. The samples are sent to green water labs. And the one thing I just want to say, because I've really enjoyed the talks today, if we're talking about collaboration, um, because we, our program, you know, we do have a very stable source of funding through the state water contractors. Um, you guys had talked about some large algal blooms in the central delta that occurred in like this year. And I know Keith spoke about this in Frank's track. And although there were not high levels of microcystin that we saw further downstream, we did see very high levels of MIB and geosmin, which were of huge concern to um, the drinking water treatment plants. And I think we would be very interested in trying to understand that connection with PABS um, and also with what's going on in Frank's track to potentially what's going on further downstream at like Clifton Court. So that's it. Thank you. Mike? I think we're going to skip questions and just go straight to our next presenter. We do have, we will have a few minutes at the end of the session for questions for all of the speakers. Um, so our next presenter, most of you know him, um, it's Tom Mumley, and he is the Assistant Executive Officer at the um, San Francisco Regional Water Quality Control Board, and we've asked him to talk about the Bay Regional Monitoring Program. Um, I, I think there's been some kind of overlap here and there, especially through like Dave's group and, and some of the modeling stuff, but we thought it would be really useful to hear what the Bay RMP is focused on for, for nutrients. And I will say, so Tom, we're going to give you the remote. We're not sure if it'll work because we're in presenter mode, so you can try it. And it's hopefully it will. He can't click on that. Screen. I think if you click and on that screen, it might not work. Sorry, I'm not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, All right, I'm going to just jump right in. Thank you. <laughs> and just make it. So I, I'm going to show. Going to, one of the punchlines is to show that they're not really separate. They're over. They're overlapped and related. What we're doing through our regional monitoring program and the adjunct, but. Um, the focus on nutrients is through the, the nutrient management strategy, but there's an interrelationship that I'll, uh, that I'll show you. Oh, okay, I'm going the wrong way. Yeah. And I'm not getting, here. getting the sense. I can, of, I can just click it. Why don't you just do it? I just wanted it because I wanted to have a pointer for one or two slides, but I might not need it. We'll see. Uh, okay, let's go ahead. Still sharing here. Oh, yeah, you're on site. Now you're not. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this this is a you know, simple overview of what we do through our regional monitoring program, showing which which media we monitor: water, sediment, shore, sport, prey fish, as well as birds and bivalves and charismatic macrofauna. On the harbor seals, uh, and we are we our initial focus was what now I'll call legacy contaminants because back in the late 80s, early 90s, major concern about the toxic pollutants of interest for heavy metals, particularly copper, nickel, some some attention to hydrocarbons which we didn't know much about, uh, you know, and so mercury, PCBs, big concern because of accumulation of fish, but. In more recent years, we're putting more and more emphasis to the large suite of emerged contaminants. In fact, we just did a re re review and redesign of what we call our status and trends program for the regular monitoring of water and sediment, fish, et cetera, and with a bias towards making it more available and applicable for emerged contaminants, and ramping things on to like, do some initial screening or rescreening or, or actually trends analysis. And Keeping it, maintaining attention to some of the legacy stuff, but but we're pairing back uh, based on like the, the the fairly large N that we've generated for the years because the regional monitoring program is now, gosh, uh, it's almost thirty years old. So we've got a pr pretty good data set to think about what's the how much can we pair back and not lose a whole lot of power in terms of trends analysis. And when, more recently, we we're putting more emphasis on sediment sediment 
physically, just because a lot of interest in sediment in the bay relative to uh, restoration, shoreline resilience and adaptation to sea level rise. Uh, uh, always had interest in sediment bound contaminant transport. And a big issue that's come into play now too is, is further consideration of beneficial use of dredge sediment for restoration purposes. So a lot of interest in sediment and nutrient has been part of our bread and butter work going back to the beginning, but primarily we're, we were relying on the, the base monitoring program that USGS had been maintaining for years and we co-fund that. Uh, but, but our efforts on nutrients enhance, got enhanced starting in the teens, 20 teens. And I'll explain that a little bit in a minute. So next slide. This just shows that the governance of the region monitoring program and otherwise we have a steering committee that's made up of the key funders of the R of the RNP, which I'll show in a second. And then we have a technical review committee that's based on uh, funding participants, um, representatives, as well as other parties. It's kind of a, it's a good think tank that's informing what the decisions that are made at the steering committee level. And then we have a series of, we've created work groups through the years which would focus attention on, on areas of interest. So you have its new sentiment work group, a maritime contaminants work group. We still maintain periodically a group that advises us on uh, sport fish monitoring. Uh, sources, pathways, and loadings that's, that emerge once we, we start out looking at things in the bay, but then we start saying, well, wait, we need to also be, uh, be aware of what's coming into the bay from key sources. And we use the term pathways to, to explain sometimes that like runoff is the source, but also is the pathway. We often try to think about how we're going to manage contaminants and runoff, not through end of pipe treatment. And so we put a lot and we put a lot of effort into understanding loadings from tributaries, storm drain systems, as well as creeks. We've had focus on PCBs and Nioxin is a subset of our interest there. We've had for a while, we put a fair amount of attention to selenium. Uh, ultimately, our water board established a, a, a selenium total maximum daily load for the North Bay. And there's still an ongoing monitoring of selenium, but we were able to sort of create a platform that reflects our understanding of management of selenium in the Bay. Uh, our main concern is what, what's, what's going to happen in the future as things change or may modify the delta upwards uh, in terms of might we get more uh, selenium enriched water from the San Joaquin versus the more selenium deplete watershed Sacramento. Although there's still, a, there's still a fair amount of, of selenium comes into San Francisco Bay from the Sacramento system just because of the magnitude of water. Uh, and we even, we're even working on microplastics. Over here, I'm showing it. We don't have a nutrient work group here because we created a separate nutrient management strategy at the water board, but looking at um, how, do we, how do we feed the, uh, the science needs for that strategy, I realize that the RMP wasn't going to be capable of doing it on, on its own. So we created a separate sort of forum that's adjunct to the steering committee. There's an overlap in terms of funding, but all the work associated with nutrients in the Bay is pretty much managed by the nutrient management strategy steering committee. And as needed, we convene a, net, a, ten, a nutrient technical work group. The key to this is that there's a fair amount of overlap between the two steering committees. I mean, I chair both of them and we have a, a couple representation that that overlapped, including a couple of people sit on both. So, there, so there's not a separate nutrient effort by the region monitor program. There's one nutrient effort in the in the in the Bay region. It's done through the nutrient management strategy, but it overlaps with what goes on in the, in the RNP. Particularly, when you think about sediment, because we're putting a lot of attention to understanding sediment and putting resources towards enhancing what's been heretofore a challenge and still is sediment transport modeling. So, but there is there's progress to be made. So overlap, a lot of overlap there. And another thing I'll say is we pursue understanding of nutrients and how to manage them. We also want to make sure that if we're going to pursue actions that we're thinking about all the actions that are necessary. So like from a wastewater treatment perspective, technologies and options to control nutrients also for, fortunately can control certain emerging contaminants. So we kind of think about this integrating our, our results. So we're coordinating and communicating with ourselves. 
Next slide. So this just shows you, recap here is just, we're currently about $4 million a year program, the regional monitoring program. The majority funder is municipal wastewater, 46%, 18% dredgers, 25% municipal stormwater, 11% industry. So these are all entities that our water board regulates and pretty much in a friendly way has required them to contribute to the regional monitoring program because it's in their interest and it's enabled us to be smart and informed through our permitting. And so it's always, it's always been considered a, a, a good investment, particularly for the wastewater community. It's a, they know that uh, the fingers pointed at them because we can, because of the regulatory mechanisms for permitting wastewater. So they've been always proactive. But of that 4 million, about $500,000 we put towards nutrients. Uh, about half of this goes straight to U USGS, and the other half goes to Dave and the, the nutrient science program that he manages. Next slide. So this shows you that our governance of the nutrient management strategy steering committee. And so we have regulators, which are including Central Valley Regional Board participates with the entities we regulate, municipal, industrial, wastewater, as well as municipal stormwater. I highlighted folks from the Delta who participate. So Lisa is a active participant. Uh, and then we have resource agencies who, because they're smart and they have good ideas to share with us. And we do have direct overlap with some of the other programs, you know, particularly USGS and what's going on in the South Bay South Pond Restoration. But we have representation, both the, the IEP and the Delta Science Program. And then not, not to mention that we also have a key environmental NGO, the Baykeeper, who's working with us actually very cooperatively, not in a tense manner. It's been a really good relationship. And we also have the the, the contractors at the table. So you can see we have a pretty broad group of stakeholders that uh, in addition to the, the type of folks that are just are part of the governance of the RP. So that's one reason to have a little broader perspective because we have more parties affected and interested, particularly with the Delta interface. Next slide. So this is a simple illustration of uh, what we know about nutrient loading to the bay. That's uh, and the circles are the wastewater treatment plants. And it's a given that the South Bay wastewater is the dominant source. North Bay, clearly it's not the same percentage. This is Bay wide percentage, 65% wastewater, 20% Delta, 50% urban runoff. South Bay is very dominated by wastewater. This is San Jose, this is East Bay Mud, this is San Francisco. This is one, one discharge from the East Bay communities. Uh, so there's like, that's that's central sand and uh, of course the circle for a regional sand is probably comparable to one of these bigger ones but not longer it's now that's substantially reduced uh i'm just showing how much nitrogen versus phosphorus is there one more if you click yes. yeah one of the things that so we understood to, to manage nutrient loads to the bay as we have started to realize the bay is losing its its resilience potentially it might even have a harmful algal bloom one of these days <laughs> and, uh, but we we actually we started say to working with the municipalities, the, the, you know, the wastewater folks. We don't have much choice. You're going to have to work with us or against us because this. They're also aware. They're, they're also aware of what happened with regional sand and the Central Valley Regional Board because ultimately it was a command. You must reduce your loads. So our folks. Building on the collaborative relationship we have through the regional monitoring program, so immediately said we want to engage with you, Tom, and, and water boards, because we recognize we have a big stake in this. So we said, okay, but uh, so let me put it in perspective. One of the early discussions that we had was how how quickly do we do we dive into um, figuring how clean is clean, what you know, what levels of nutrients are okay, considering how enriched the bay is. We knew that's going to be a complicated question because it's one of the most enriched estuaries in the system in the world but yet it doesn't have problems other estuaries have but what could go wrong so but so we get a com but we have a commitment from the bear PWs. if uh, we want to work with you and we will what we like to if you resist if you hold back and imposing load requirements on us we will commit money to advance the science to have a foundation for what would be load requirements and and we will commit to doing planning and early actions for nutrient load load reduction 
That was a combination. You have to do that. That's where this number came from. So they did a, we call it a sort of a silver platter, a, a high, a, like a first, second order evaluation of every water, every plant. What could they do to optimize their current systems for nutrient load reduction or what uh, two levels of upgrades and you know like full upgrades of all the plants could be i think the number has even been mentioned to be 12 or 14 billion um, but it's it's a lot of money um, so we said of course tech regional spent almost two billion dollars so of public funds to to do what they've done but we've said fortunately we have at the, when we started time we still seem to have time the, the bay is not showing acute problems yet so let's get rolling and uh, if we're going to particularly if we're going to have to spend that much money let's make sure we know what we're doing and what other uses for those resources would we would we have this really boils down to we've been having this dialogue about a regional approach towards wastewater management which could be how much recycled water could be could be created by that or if we're going to do additional treatment how about nature-based treatment systems that could be part of restoration and climate change civil rise resilience and adaptation so we're actually doing analysis now of how much load reduction or i should say the wastewater folks are doing the analysis now of how much load reduction could they get from recycled water or from nature-based solutions at what cost. So we'll have a portfolio of actions. Again, there's early actions built into both Grayscale as well as some of the nature-based work. There's some pilot nature-based systems being implemented. All right. Well, one thing I could tell you, good news is we, we at the board, we contemplated starting with sort of a, like, a, uh, what's the right word? You know, like an anti-dig, um, you know, let's let's make sure we don't make the problem worse. So we contemplated load caps, and uh, and so, but that was that was like a, an aversion to the wastewater folks. Don't impose caps on us. We will we will pursue actions. What we've discovered recently, loads have leveled. You know, prior to that, they would increase two to three percent a year. Uh, partly attributed to population and workforce growth. So some of that flattening has to do with the pandemic and there's a lot less people peeing in San Francisco every day because there's a daily population of San Francisco is pretty big, but it's also a uh, reflection of improvements in the current treatment systems. Next slide. I only got a couple more. So this one just illustrates uh, how we're, we're applying our science program. And it comes across complicated, but let me see if I can simplify it for you. The bottom here shows you the color code, the five program areas where we kind of uh, categorical work areas. Synthesis, or is an assessment framework where we're building a framework of what are the what are the conditions that reflect good or bad in the system, direct or indicators of change, so we can determine what is what are bad observations? Are there perhaps numeric indicators that are either a direct reflection of something bad or indicator that something might be bad, especially if we want to track trends, we have to see that there's an early indication of the bay may be losing its resilience. And then we have mod modeling, monitoring, and special studies. And then you see the relative magnitude of effort putting into these science focus areas. Nutridynamics is loading, fate, transformation, biogeochemical studies, attention to phytoplankton DO in the open bay. They were pretty confident that bay DO generally is okay. We were to confirm that, where we know that there are certain margin areas, especially in the lower South Bay sloughs and tidal creeks, where you have abnormally low DO. That's uh, we're, we're trying to understand the role nutrients play to that and, and other factors. And it's complicated by the restoration of the salt ponds is changing things dramatically down there. So that's that's a lot of lot of attention there. And then HABs uh, is in here, although you see the modeling part of HABs is pretty small because we really can't model HABs, but we could try to model if we have some insight to what are the conditions that you know, help create that maybe. But one of the challenges, anyway, I'm not going to go off on that tangent, but because you know, now there's everybody's asking us, can we predict when another half would happen like what just happened? Uh, and <laughs> we'd love to. We'd love to be able to figure that out. Well, uh, enough said. And we are investing in modeling resources and work going on in, in coastal impacts. So we all have to be concerned by, in addition to the Delta and the Bay, there are concerns about 
impacts nutrients could have on the coastal environment with acidification, and there might even be some sort of a mandate that comes at us from an ocean perspective. So we're we're partnering up with work that's going off on the coast, and this last bar is where we want, what can we do about predicting, you know, looking at future scenarios and risk of different scenarios happening. Again, it's challenging to do that with our existing models, that question that came up at the end, but what, what, what extent, if we can understand the current conditions, at least can we at least have some probabilistic or relative confidence in what the future may, may look like. Next slide. Oh yeah, this case, the Nutrient Management Science Program is $3 million a year. That's on top of the Regional Monitoring Program with the 500,000 overlap, but we get $2.2 million a year on average from the, the POTW community. And then we cobble together you know, another th average $300,000. So put that in perspective, you know. So we got a few bucks, that's sort of level funding, which is important. Um, it's part of the day of creating a team and sustaining it. Uh, you can't just go up and down. Next slide is a, is a in one big slide shows you the various types of things we are doing. The yellow boxes are the historical spine of the bay, ship-based monitoring that the USGS has done for years and overlapping with DWR does. Uh, that's just an illustrator of some of the collaborators. Hold on for the next click. The circles are moored stations. And uh, the, the this pinkish ones are ones that we've established. Uh, the red ones, actually, these red ones, I think we've now deployed in the South Bay. And uh, and then we forecasted there's one, at least one of the new USGS ones up, up in Sassoon Bay shows up, but I'm realizing from the presentation, there's probably more up there than we realize. We also know that there's a series of these of these stations that don't monitor for everything, but they might be available to build upon. As we know, we actually, R&P funds some sediment monitoring by USGS at some of the fixed stations. And so can we, can we add other sensors to that? We also do algal toxin monitoring at key locations around the Bay perimeter, looking at algal toxins in, in mussels, right, Dave, mussels. And uh, I'll leave it at that. And over here, you see that we also uh, proposed and have started doing the high speed mapping. And I really great that Brian, you explain a number of this stuff in your presentation, both high speed mapping as well as what goes on at, at those stations. The last, or this just shows you and illustrating how much of this high speed mapping we've done for the few years. Uh, focusing in on the South Bay, we'd like to do it up north, and it's good to see that your work is actually goes at least down into S Sassoon Bay, you know, the uh, San Pablo Bay, sort of, you know, strike, wanting to have some more attention possibly as we put our things together. All right, that's that's the nutshell overview. I thought you might be interested in what just happened. Next slide is uh, this is the northern part of South San Francisco Bay. And if you see that that splotch right there, that's Lake Merritt in Oakland. That's sort of where the bloom was first, first recognized, first recognized maybe in the estuary between Lake uh, Oakland and uh, Alameda Island. And so what I'm showing here is remote sensing data, chlorophyll A, showing the movement of the bloom from that part near Oakland as it progressed the first few days out into the northern part of South San Francisco Bay. So you think August 4th to over here, August 13th, and then the next week, you know, as it gets darker, darker, it gets higher levels. And you see it just took over the South Bay. The little critters went out and somebody said, hey, folks, there's a lot of nutrients out here. Come on, it's, it's a feeding frenzy. They, you know, it basically took over the bay. I mean, which I don't know if it's on there. One night, Dave calls me up one night to talk. We'd been out in the bay, so we were fortunate. We didn't have set aside money for these type of events, but we do have committed funding. So we worked up dynamically. Dave said, "Tom, what do we do? Can, you know, I said, what can you do? And he said, well, we can get out there, but we don't have money for it. We'll have to." sacrifice something house, but we easily determined this is an all hands on deck event. And so Dave mobilized along with fortunately you know, USGS support. So they not only do we have this remote sensing, but they're out doing weekly doing the, the mapping work and showing corresponding uh, levels of nitrate and chlorophyll, the DO depression, et cetera. So I thought you'd be interested in 
that we that, that's the fact that at one point he said he came back and saying, yeah, the whole it's the whole South Bay is the red tide, and they were seeing large fish, sturgeon, and uh, striped bass belly up. I don't know if some of you heard it. In um, Lake Merritt alone, they counted 10,000 dead fish. Who would imagine there's that many fish in Lake Merritt? <laughs> but it's, but it is, it is. Right. But there, Dave orchestrated some uh, some citizen monitoring. We, there, the count is at least 150 sturgeon were found dead in the South Bay. Last slide is just the final. Oh, no, I just wanted to make a picture. You want to know more about the HAB? Dave is going to give a presentation at the San Francisco Bay annual meeting next Monday explaining what we've learned about it and where we're going with that. I just want to let you know it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid meeting. There might be a couple for free, a couple seats remaining, but it's available virtu virtually. So if you want to Google San Francisco Bay annual meeting, you'll find it. Otherwise, Martin T at sfei.org can help you register. Then the last slide is uh, plenty, you know, clear there's plenty of need and opportunity to communicate, coordinate, collaborate, whether it's on our modeling, doing being consistent in terms of the types of observations we're doing and where we're, when we're doing them, and just even sharing the knowledge. Uh, we, we should have these kind of forums on a regular basis, not, you know, between our, our groups so we all know what's going on. And I'll stop there because I've used my time up. So a little off schedule, but I think we'll take the next 10 minutes to just ask questions of this last session speakers. Um, go ahead. So Lisa described um, really cool experiments we've done and manipulating the uh, uh, chart. You know, what happened? Just, sorry, we're going to get a Paul Flint description. I have to say it again. Yeah. All right. And where am I going to end? So, Lisa, <laughs> there you go. Oh, <laughs> right so I, so I, I know your question, but you might just re ask it again. All right. So, Lisa uh, gave some good examples of what uh, what we can do experimentally by turning off the wastewater treatment plant and seeing what happens. And we um, did a couple of great experiments with that uh, in the Sacramento River. And I'm just wondering if there's, you think there's opportunities to do that in uh, the South Bay dischargers? Yes, to an extent. But I mean, a big, big believer when I mean, you understand that the benefit of uh, doing a perturbation like that on a system and then see how it reacts, that's great. It, uh, we have nothing that I think that's significant, but we do have a couple of plants that are. Are, are upgrading, although I, I, uh, you know, but I think the, the plants that are upgrading aren't the big ones. So, uh, so we don't have the obvious uh, changes to, to, to you know, knobs to turn, but we have some some partial knobs to turn, right, Dave? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you if you you get about what I guess obviously we're we are we're tracking where these early actions are happening, and now that we have we now have a our data set in, in this in space and time is improved. We can we can start seeing like the, in, have things changed now that loads aren't continuing to increase. That's that's that is a, a change in in the system. At least if these if this flattening out state state, but we don't have the same opportunity as that. But I we will look for it and, and take advantage of everyone we can. Uh, well, we, 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 well, I want to stop there. But, but I'll go, I would say somebody suggested if, what if this algal bloom problem we had was a regular thing? It's a dramatic, it's again a game changer. All of a sudden, there's a lot of attention to what we're doing. And we're, we're definitely talking about more than load caps in the near future. We're talking about load load reductions. The issue is how, how low and how fast. But are we going to get more resources, more attention to this now that the people see how vulnerable the bay is to these events? So maybe we'll be able to uh, affect other things. Like even should we uh, turn off certain loadings during periods where they were most vulnerable? Some of the wastewater plants, like East Bay Mud, 
20% uh, of their nutrient load associated with what they call resource recovery. They take on extra uh, biomatter, I mean, uh, waste from farms and wineries, and they process it, they create energy, but, uh, but it ends up putting a lot more nutrients in the bank. Could, we, could that be stored temporarily and then processed later? I just want to add to that quickly. Dave, what's the residence time in the South Bay? Because even if you coordinated a nutrient hold amongst all the plants, I just imagine that the flushing time is so long, you couldn't really get an absence of wastewater in the system. Uh, yeah, that's. I think that's exactly right. Different from the riverine system here, where if you stop, you all of a sudden have clean water going by or nutri relatively nutrient-free. That Yeah, I would imagine it, it, it's probably weeks. Oh, yeah. I mean, this has been a question for, for years now about that res you know, understanding the residence time, risk circulation, but like the, the large loaders at the northern end, they do a lot of that does get flushed out, but the big there's a big loader, San Jose, right down there, and the fate, the long-term fate of San Jose that we've talked thought about. If we turned off all loadings to the South Bay, how long would it take for it for the South Bay to actually respond to that? Because there's such a reservoir of, of of nutrients and the sediments in the system that that would take a long time, not only for the inputs to, to turn off, but what's in there has to flush out. Well, we often see the nutrients completely go to zero in the South Bay over the shoals. I mean, we the 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 biological processing of nutrients is can be extreme there in the South Bay. So that's that's, well, that's what I'm thinking about. Well, that's good, good because that's where or we're got on our attention, right, Dave? Because we historically we weren't looking in the shoals, but now that we're looking in the shoals, then Kazam, there's a lot, lot going on there. <laughs> and uh, holy Kazam, you know, like we are. That's why we're buddy, that suite of more stations <laughs> doing the, the the rapid mapping to make to learn more about that. Yeah, so maybe right, you got something going there. Great, I just want to see. Yeah, Lena, there's, there's anyone online that could maybe just ask. Um, does anybody online have a question for the speakers in this session? If so, please raise your hand or hit star nine. I still need to. I have a question for Brian. Is when you did your um your retention time or your you know I'm not using the right terminology or the age. Um, are you also at the same time able to characterize in a multi system like the Delta source source plus age, or is it just age? Uh, kind of. <laughs> and in some places, yeah. because yeah. we do have instrumentation where we can resolve different water sources. Mm -hmm. We really haven't brought that to fruition yet, so I, I think we can do that kind of thing in specific locations. We can recognize, for example, the agricultural discharge water in the system um, versus the ambient water. There's versus the wastewater in. I was I was even thinking like where the Sacramento came in. We had that on the Sacramento. We had McCollumy. We had uh, uh, San Joaquin, yeah. and that mixture, especially that's happening on the east side of the Delta, if. If not only where we see longer retention times, if you can also see what water it is that's actually mixing. Well, I would guess that the best way to approach a problem like that would be to do it in combination with models mm -hmm. to do the field measurements compare well with the model results. I, I don't I don't think the resolution of the field measurements are going to give you that level of discrimination, different rivers and um uh of various ages okay. it's just not that good i have a question um and i i mean i a lot of I'm, I'm coming back to my lab background uh where i came from and i know i think it was ted who brought up how you know in their lab they realized as they were upgrading their methods to standard methods that some had migrated over time and my belief is that a lot of the labs that you guys all run are kind of exempt from ELAP because you are state funded or like research. or federal research type of labs. But I'm wondering as you know, the regulated labs are all being required to upgrade to new standards. Are any of you know any of the labs that are being used for the research, are they also either 
TNI or going up to ELEX, the new standards or any of that for the data that is being used? We are. Uh, the EMP or DWR is credited it's in the process. Uh, I mean, they are accredited, but they're doing, forget which order they're doing it, they're doing ELAP and then the same. Okay. Yeah, that is, that is happening. Uh, and that is, am, am I right in that you guys are exempt from having to do it, or do you? I don't think have so, no, I think oh, you're required. Does USDF, I think? I'm not I don't. I'm just going to say yes because we are. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say it's probably yes and no because indirectly because it is state law. It's not going to be. Yeah, they're federal. No, it depends on what data yeah. being used. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking, I got a question. You know, first, partly observation, which it seems like uh, one is like obviously in the Bay Area, we actually have the benefit of our wastewater community stepping up in their own interest to work with this collaborative. You don't have the same playing field here. I mean, you had regional sand, did what it did, did but you don't have uh, a number of wastewater entities contributing nutrients. Most of all the other plants are smaller, plus they have nutrient reduction. But like who who is available to fund this? So it's, it's impressive to see you know, in a nutshell like what, what DWR is doing. So we're fortunate to have that network, but it's unfortunate to hear from Brian how little federal funding is available for such important work that nationally. And so like, it, it's, it's, it hurts me to understand how USGS funding has been cut, not, not grown, but yet look how valuable the work is. So you said something pretty profound though, like the need for level funding, and you're talking about increasing, just kind of get level mm -hmm. funding. In your, if you're willing to say it, in your view, what would that be? Like what would your, you know, you know, think reasonable expectation for a funding level that to, to sustain your ability to inform this important decision and maybe even grow it a notch. Uh, like we can get people who can grab some lobbies in, in, in Washington to give us some resources because this is such an important question. But don't get, don't, if you will turn off any political <laughs> consequences here, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, just order of magnitude. Yeah. Like, how many, like what? You know, Ten million. So, 20 million. See, my name is Keith Palmer Gregson. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so back in the De Calpad days, um, there was talk about uh, some uh, ongoing federal contribution that would be helpful. What, what I'm, what I'm talking, what I was talking about was. Uh, coordination of funding opportunities through the proposal different process, so that they don't all come up, they don't all come to fruition at once. Because you know, suddenly we've got we've got more work than we can do, and then we have trouble keeping our people on because we run out of money. That's the problem I was thinking of. It would be great, and I think it's appropriate, and to have federal support for the kind of work we do. Um, on the other hand. We're pretty confident we're addressing management needs through our work because we have to ask management to support us to do it. So I, I don't know. It's a little bit be careful what you wish for. Um, All right. Well, that's that's a kind of diplomatic response. But, <laughs> but, but just how about this? Uh, nobody how much, accused me of being much, diplomatic. What's your, what's, your, what's your regular budget? Um, what is our regular for our research group? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, Mark. Um, it's a. Uh, well, if you want to, I mean, just hydrodynamics measuring the flows. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's, that's the, multiple millions. Six right to there. seven million dollars a year. We're four to five million dollars. And we're just at a new group. And there's the push group. So I mean, it, you have to be a little bit more specific. I think. But you're talking in the order of magnitude of you know, uh, 10, 20 million crop total. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, it's amazing how much work it takes just, like I said, to the flow network and, and, and the water quality network, and that's what we need to be that you are. That's relevant. Yeah. Is that relevant? Thank you. Yeah, when we had the National Water Quality Assessments, um, we were getting about uh, one and a half to two, two million a year, and that was just water quality work. And now that's gone. I have a question. Hey, you had your hand up. Yeah, so Tom was showing some graphics of this 
Cadillac monitoring program. We put an idea, dreaming idea we put together several years ago. And, it, and we've been gradually implementing within that plan. And one of the things that it called out was very presumptuously um, partnering with USGS Water Science Center, IEP, Delta RMP to kind of have this um, daywide monitoring program where people took care of the things more in their backyard, but also worked together. And I was curious. I don't know enough about the operating rules around IEP and how much flexibility you have. Like you're, there's man, you're mandated to do certain things, whether you're allowed to say, oh, okay, somebody else has this covered, we're going to go do this more of this to create those efficiencies. And I, 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 you, you follow what I mean, Ted? Kind of, and I, I don't want to speak for all of IEP because what I do oh, is- Sorry, EMP, e yeah. excuse so, me. So EMP, EMP is very, very specific about what we do, especially geographic. Mm -hmm. So, go to D1641, where we paid 192. There's table five. In table five, it lists all of the stations we have to sample every month and what we have to sample at those stations. We got to do it. And that's why that's why there's funding. It's because of that water rights decision, because it's in the permit from the water boards to operate the state water project. And so, there's never a question, oh, are we going to go out this month or next month? We're going out every month. Now, within that, you know, it says, you know, when it says, it says we have to monitor phytoplankton, this is how to say we have to monitor phytoplankton using Uter Mole's 1958 method for enumerating, you know, the <laughs> super tax and count 400 phytoplankton units, right? There is some leeway, and that's why we do things like we start using the floor probe and we, you know, switch from YSI 6600s to YSI XO2s. And we do that because of the conversations that we have and because of the state of the science. And so we do have those, the ability to be flexible, but what we don't have with any OP is like, if I was talking to Keith a month ago and he said, hey, can the Sentinel go out in the South Bay and do a transect because we can get a out there? Absolutely not. There's no way on God's green earth that we're going to do that. It's just not going to happen. That's not what it is. And that's because we do compliance monitoring. And now we do special studies, but the special studies and the things that we do when we're collecting data for this cyanotoxin study, for example, right? We're doing that at the stations we already visit. So we're already there. We're there if we grab these samples. It, it gets a little hazy because we do do extra trips in the car and stuff like that. So it's not, I'm making it seem very draconian and we do have some flexibility, but there exists outside of EMP at DWR. There are, we used to have an entire unit for special studies, and that was like where Peggy Lehman was, right? Peggy was in the special studies unit. Peggy would do these individually funded projects that were not part of compliance monitoring. And so we have other very capable scientists, and but because of the way that the state governance works, we do not have the ability to grow and decline like USGS does, right? We can't just turn around. I couldn't, you know, if we got, I don't know, the governor signed a thing and said, hey, do, you know, do all this extra monitoring. Maybe I could then, but I, I can't just say, if we have extra money, I want to hire three environmental scientists. To do that. Of course, I can't do that. It's a whole process of hiring new people, creating positions. A uh, kind of, of civil service procedures. And so we have to be very, very cautious and, and, you know, of doing what we do. And most of the science that we do that collaborates with these things is based, is, is done off the back of the scientists who fully believe in the work. And it's not because we're getting paid more to do it. It's not, be, it's because we believe this is important and that's why we're doing it. So. Does that, does that answer what you're saying? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we got to wrap up. We have got to wrap up because we <laughs> want to get you guys out here. So <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with kind of a couple reminders and then have a Meredith, Meredith will just close off. So for steering committee members, we asked you to think about four homework questions. What are your highest priority management and assessment questions that you'd like to prioritize for nutrients and HABs? What are the data gaps that you're interested in? You'd like the uh, data, uh, the Delta Mon Regional Monitoring Plan to uh, pursue or fill, excuse me. What are the specific monitoring or special study recommendations you heard 
today that your agency or sector would be interested in including in the multi-year study design for nutrients and HABs? And what are the topics or presentations you would like additional conversations or discussions on? So think about that and talk about that. In the meantime, Monday, Bay Area RMP, November 6th and 7th or 7th and 8th? 7th and 8th. Registration is open. Anyways, regardless, registration <laughs> is open for their HAB monitoring workshop. Workshop. Thank you. I was, thank you. Del 8th and 9th. Okay, we knew it was somewhere in there. So, it, it, but it's online. That's open also. So, both those are online. Um, Delta RMP Steering Committee, we have our next meeting on November 30th, 30th in the afternoon, I believe. Is that correct? I think it's in the afternoon. Don't, you you got the uh, calendar invite. So there is a lot to do and think uh, think about that. And I know, I know that Meredith's going to say it, but I just really appreciate everyone that's come out, everyone online, but especially the speakers that really came to prepare and those that worked um, to prepare and work on this symposium. I, I feel really good about it. So yeah. sorry if I stole your thunder. No, 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 that's okay. I actually <laughs> just want to call out a few people. Um, you haven't heard from her today, but um, Jennifer Glenn is in the back there. And Melissa, you saw the session a a lot of work to prepare today. They got us all the lovely food that's here. And you guys have all seen Ryan because he's up at the front. And they have been all the technical aspects of making this happen. This is actually our first official hybrid meeting in this room with presentations. And I actually expected way more glitches. So thank you both because we didn't have any. Um, I think with that, we'll I was going to say, do you want to? I'm like kind of going. Um, one, one other reminder, yeah. just that we will post the presentation, so I'll yeah. touch base with the presenters, make sure there's not any slides you last minute wanted to change, you don't want out to be in a PDF, and then we will have the recording, we might do a little bit of just clipping it so it's not a full eight hours that you have to watch at one time, uh, but those will, will come out and we'll do an email announcement when they're available. Okay. okay. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. You, everyone. And thank you. so good to see you guys in person. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs>